Hello, good evening. Welcome to Thilvu NRI Radio, weekly webinar immigration webinar on immigration with the attorney the Lucas Garrison. Yes, we are doing uh, this show last couple of months to give the more information on USA immigration and uh, providing simplification of uh, immigration complexity of immigration system in United States of America. So yeah, please tune to Telugu and our radio Facebook live and uh, get more information and uh, you can connect to. Uh, we open the conference call conference call. Maybe you can join to conference call or you can you can get uh, the Facebook live and post your questions or your topic. Maybe I will discuss with uh, Lucas get more information about the topic and questions. So. Today we we will discuss about um, already we we are at August 20 October 21st only nine days left to close this October month. We are in middle of uh, the 485 process uh, application. We will ask about this uh, if any additional questions or if any um, new information about the 485 process. Then go for the hottest topic uh, artist uh, topic. H1 wages increased. And later we can discuss about the premium process and uh, the LCA change address changes. Then if you can call and uh, you can ask the question to Lucas and uh, get more information about your question. So we can invite to Lucas. Hi Lucas, welcome to today's show. Hi, Venkat. Thank you for having me, and thank you, uh, everyone who's uh, watching, for joining us again this week on our uh, weekly uh, webcast. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Lucas, and uh, thanks for your efforts. Uh, just uh, as I discussed, we are in middle of October. The how is going the process for it? The process. Well, uh, it's quite a bit of work. Everything is uh, slow and. Uh, methodic whenever you're dealing with these types of cases you know we don't want to make any uh mistake or or impatiently do anything that would cause you know a, a case to be denied or rejected so uh it is hard sometimes to have patience but uh you know uh, we want to make sure everything is perfect whenever it's uh, submitted to the uscis but so it's a lot of work okay yeah thank you uh, Lucas, I have a little bit confusion about um, downgrade I-140. Again, it means uh, I'm getting, I got more, more and more information, but still have a little bit confusion. Let's say if any H1 holder is on H EB2, he want to downgrade to EB3. The what is the process? Is he need to select the amendment, or you need to select as a new new I-140? I think well, we discussed it earlier, but uh, give me the more in detail so that maybe I can I can clarify the question. So as we discussed, you know, the past two weeks, the the, the basic uh, idea is either filing a uh, new petition uh, where you would have a, a separate filing or amend the previous case or downgrade, uh, so to speak, uh, that case, um, you know, the policy with USCIS, uh, you know, for many, many years now, since I think 2007, as long as your, you know, labor was filed, the ETA 9089 was filed with uh, uh, an I-140 before it expired. And as long as some action took place on that case, so if it was denied, you could still reuse an expired ETA or labor, uh, or if it was approved, you can still reuse it. Um, I know there's been some confusion, some other uh, attorneys have put out a letter saying, you know, you need to have a certified signed off uh, copy or it's going to be rejected. And there's been some confusion in regards to should I amend or file fresh? Well, to, to give clarification, yes, there have been some rejections and I'll tell you why. Uh, in the past, the Department of Labor would mail the actual copy of the certified ETA. And once we receive that, it's everyone's, sign this and seen it. It's a blue copy, uh, front and back, 
and you know it's about 15 pages or so and um you know that that's what we submit with the i-140 when it's a fresh filing uh here recently due to covid the department of labor is emailing the notice okay so what does that mean how is this impacting what we're talking about now with downgrades well what it means is whenever we get the certified copy that's signed off on by the certified officer it's an email now and you still have the option like what i'm doing now with a lot of these cases i'll go and pull uh the eta that was filed maybe in 2013 or 2012 from the employer's uh site so you can pull those from there and download it but it's not a certified copy uh, you have to have the actual certified copy would be what comes uh, either in the mail or now through email so you know what it means is um, you can always request USCIS to you know uh, get a fresh copy you know which is what we do on all of the requests because we're not filing with an original uh, 9089 approval uh, or labor so, you know, there's been a lot of confusion with that. The rejections that from the group that I'm a member of, from AILA, uh, from our own members, have said that the rejections primarily have come from people downloading from the website and, met and sending those in because those don't have the officer's signature. Now, uh, I think, you know, maybe there's a little confusion on that or, or whatnot. I know there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of doubt, you know, should I file a fresh I-140? Are they going to reject it, you know, with this case? Or should I downgrade like what we've been discussing, downgrading from EB2 to EB3 or maintaining two uh, petitions? So um, that that's more or less where it's, everything's come from. And, um, you know, I, as a rule of thumb, if anyone has any doubts or worries, I would always say do the downgrade uh filing which is or amendment um because right now we're talking about uh, the filing date final action dates are whenever the case is going to be processed and we're still looking at 2009 2010 for eb2 and eb3 respectively so as of right now i mean you're still under the current system years away from benefiting from anything so what we want to do is actually worry about having your case mailed in having the case be complete having the case uh, be considered for the benefit we're seeking and then move forward from there. We don't want rejections or denials. So in doing so, I would recommend, you know, we all proceed with downgrades, uh, but you're, fi you're also free to file a fresh case with a previously used uh, labor, and then you would have two petitions, so to speak. Okay. Okay. Lucas is. Um, uh, let's say this this will um, uh, work for. Here are two scenarios, right? Always we work two scenarios here to downgrade um, I one forty. Mm -hmm. Let's say the H one B holder still in same consultant, same employer since he applied I one forty or approved I one forty. Uh, what if um, uh, if employer uh, went to another? employer and you want to process from previous employer i-140 the scenario is same or is anything bit different than uh, uh different than existing employer future employment of uh, events already left the employee you mean uh in regards to downgrading or just filing period mm, yeah downgrade it means i'm 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 interested to get more information on the downgrade i-140 so if you um Again, let's say you go to you start with employer A, uh, they file I one forty, and you leave, and you go to employer B. Employer B might not have started the um, the porting process uh, for a new I one forty, or maybe it's in process and not complete yet. Uh, and this opportunity arises. Well, what you can do is go back to employer A, and you can still, without working for them at the moment, you can still file a downgrade. Um, obviously, like we've discussed in weeks past, you have to show improve the ability to pay, uh, which is going to be the proffered wage listed on the ETA form of your labor. You're going to have to make sure that the company has assets or profits in it 
an excess of that amount uh, to show that they had that you that they have the ability to pay that proffered wage. Now you don't. There's no requirement to actually work for the company uh, while this is pending. There's no requirement to technically work for the company once you receive GC. It's good if you do work for the company in the future because that question will come up and you know if you become a citizen apply to do that they're going to ask well you know this company petitioned for you but did you ever work for them uh why or why not um but it, you know going back to your question you know right now it would just be that you they have the ability to pay that wage now let's say one year elapses and we're still um pending a uh Adjustment of status, the visas aren't available. I want to go from uh, employer B to employer C. So what do I do? Well, I can transfer my H-1B. I can work for employer C. And whenever the final action dates become current on our uh, visa bulletin, what I can do is uh, once it's time for my interview or if I get a request for evidence, I can submit a new uh, supplement J with a new employer, uh, not have to file any other additional cases, no additional labors or anything like that. And I can uh, port my uh, pending adjustment of status application to be supported by employer C. Now you can do this for as many employers as you might be from uh, the time of right now to the time you receive the visa. So. Um, it, it's pretty straightforward. The main issue that we want to clarify is it's very important to have a case filed and to have a case uh, pending so that you, you have more freedoms um, uh, and less burden if you change employers or, you know, if you go full time and, you know, maybe the company's policy is not to file labors for, for I-140s. Well, maybe their policy is different for supplement J's because there's less uh, cost, less time, less effort involved in filing that. Okay. Uh, okay, Lucas. So we are talking about the downgrade um, amendment or new new I-140. This amendment you are saying is a amendment is fine to uh, applying for the I-140. This amendment across it, it apply for the all uh, who downgraded from EB2, EB3, or only any s a specific um, segment or specific scenario we can choose for the amendment? Well, I mean, that's what you're doing. If you're downgrading, you're taking an existing EB2 and you're changing it to EB3. So that's what we, what we use the terminology downgrade. Um, if you're filing a separate petition, a separate petition altogether is its own case so there's not you know i think there's maybe that's where the confusion is uh we like to use the term downgrade um like what we discussed before and i don't really like to use prefer to the uh, amend amendment part, uh, term just because of the confusion that there could be with um, other uses of that uh word especially in h1b so whenever we talk about downgrading we're actually discussing uh quote unquote i guess amending the case changing the case from ab2 to eb3 okay in this case the eb2 still is valid or in that case no but uh, you can always uh, uh you know in the future if you want to upgrade just as you downgrade you can always upgrade in the future um and i, I want to discuss this uh, a lot of people are are concerned about the process or the, the possibility of going from EB2 to EB3, back to EB2, what's going to happen if this changes? Um, you know, right now, the, the final action dates move some, but they're still at, you know, 2009 for EB2 and 2010 for EB3. We're still at the current trend, the current pace. We're still years away from anyone actually receiving the GC for someone with a priority date of 2000. 13. Okay. So let's take, for example, if you're EB2 2013, there's no reason to worry about do I need to hold on to this to change back or move around because of things that we, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so to speak. You know, it's human nature. We, we worry about things like this. Um, the most important thing you can do is to have your application pending. 
that application pending gives you more than just the, you know, the foot in the door to get your employment authorization or advanced parole. And why am I bringing this up? Well, we're not in an election year. Okay. Uh, if let's say the Democrats uh, win a majority of the seats in Congress and also the presidency, well, the president would take office in January along with all the other members of Congress um, who are newly elected. And what would happen is um, within the first 100 days, the president's going to set an agenda. Now, there's probably two or three main topics that the president's going to address, one of which would be comprehensive immigration reform. So what could happen if, if all these events transpire? Well, in the past, you know, we've seen it for there's been grace periods. If anyone's filed an application by a certain date that they receive a immigration benefit, you know, regardless of how many people have filed. Uh, this could also mean, you know, we see a huge backlog for H-1B visa holders who are adjusting status. Uh, Congress would have the authority to issue, you know, they could say we want to issue one million visas to clear this backlog. And, you know, literally within that next year, however long it would take for the cases to be adjudicated, uh, it doesn't matter if you'd be EB-2 or EB-3 because the backlog would would be addressed equally, Right. So what you're doing, instead of worrying about if I file on EB2 or EB3, if you have the opportunity, you should file because things can change just like how everyone uh, saw this year when we got the news of the visa bulletin announced, uh, you know, in August where they said that they're, they're going to re potentially reissue uh, unused family based uh, visas for the employment based categories, like what we've seen this month. Okay. So just because, you know, you're making plans for EB2 because that, that might come up sooner five years from now. Well, five years from now, there might be a completely different system or the visa backlog might be gone. So why make plans for something and worry about something that's not, that potentially might not ever exist? Okay. Yeah, is a good information. Uh, just I want to touch base. Um, let's say this is a, if even the GC numbers moving is everything is good. Let's say is, is GC is not moving uh, EB2 and EB3 parallel or maybe some delays in between. Let's say in future and um, EB, EB2 is moving forward. If anyone want to upgrade, I mean, first he down, he, initial petition is uh, EB2. He downgraded EB3 in current situation. In future, he want to upgrade the same uh, scenario or the same um, the steps he need to follow to upgrade or uh, is that that is and second one is the same priority date will attach the even upgrade from eb3 to eb eb2 correct so your priority date is your priority date so as long okay. as you have a same or similar job opportunity uh you know like when you're porting or filing a a separate petition you know you can use the same priority date that's we're, we're and that's a, a safer f way of when you say downgrade or upgrade uh, you're basically taking something that's already been approved so if you you know ported your employment from one employer to another the decision's already been made uh, if this qualifies for portability for a same or similar job so it's a safer route and then what you would do is you would just the same as you downgraded since everyone already had EB2 to begin with, you could then upgrade and go back to that visa category. It would require filing again with the I-140, but again, uh, it's a safer option than uh, the alternative, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Now, do you, as the past 20 days, do you find any new information or do you find any the new process for applying the 480, 485. Uh, do you want to share any additional information about the process 485? Uh, I mean, filing adjustment applications is pretty much the same as it's, it's been. Uh, the only real change here recently is the new uh, I-944 form, uh, which was uh, published uh, in February or March of this year. Um, and then, it, you know, it was suspended from 
use by, because of a, a court injunction, and now we're back to using it. So, um, you know, that's the only new thing. Uh, you know, probably by the time a majority of all the cases we're filing come to see uh, GC interviews or anything like that, the, the, I doubt that USCIS will still be using that form or that process. So it'll all be you know, pretty much paper waste at that point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's go for the next uh, H-1B, the recent changes, wages got increased. Correct. So I have little, uh, admins, we will discuss very deep uh, in deep. Just I want to understand here, the Department of Labor and the USCS are the independent agency, I think. Okay. Yeah. For applying the H-1B, first we apply the LCA in the uh, Department of Labor. Once the LCA approved, then we we attach the approved, approval LCA and uh, apply for the I-797. So here, my question is, uh, who increased the wages level, the DOL or USCS? Who is authority to increase the wages? So that's a good question. Uh, Department of Labor is uh, who sets that standard. And you're correct. You have to file uh, a labor condition application or LCA. Uh, it has to be certified prior to the filing of the uh, I-129 petition for H-1B status. So USCIS handles the I-129. Department of Labor handles the uh, labor condition application or LCA. Now, what happened is, you know, both of these are agencies within the federal government and both of the agencies ultimate boss is the president of the United States. So, um, you know, there, there were also new forms that were possibly going to be submitted in, con in conjunction with the wage increase. Uh, and those, that rule was, um, you know, pretty much, uh, dead on arrival. There was a court case filed. Uh, the rule was suspended from being implemented, uh, and much to the same, this rule with department of labor, uh, is going to follow the same uh, uh, peril as the the last rule with the form changes and everything else. So uh, right now, I think I know my organization. I'm a member of American Immigration Lawyers Association has filed a lawsuit, uh, you know, seeking to enjoin the the new rule because of the they they technically broke the rules the president did uh, yeah. administering and so. Also, I think uh, IT Serve Alliance has filed um, a court case against Department of Labor as well. And, uh, you know, hopefully by the end of this week or next week, things will go back. Now, there's other ways of, so when we file LCAs, not to go too much into detail, but we're looking to, for, to establish a prevailing wage. Okay, so one of the sources that we use to establish the prevailing wage is actually uh, from the... Uh, for uh, the FLCD uh, wage levels published by Department of Labor, we can still get independent surveys or uh, uh, other source materials to submit, you know, for the prevailing wage. So it's not like it's the one only way we can get the wage levels, but hopefully, you know, it, it's caused a great commotion uh, and hopefully it'll pass here in the next week or 10 days. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I about to ask that question. I think uh, one step back. Uh, I have a couple of questions on uh, DOL, Department of Labor. So we are discussing about the wages increase. Uh, last decade, I I be, I'm seeing. Uh, is there any standard percentile increase? It means uh, now on October six, they released as a um, uh, different segment. One of the segment is increase up to sixty one percentile. So is there any standard or how they are calculated the percentage increase? Do you have any information on that one? Uh, so level one went from 17 percentile to 45th. Level two, they increased from 34 to 62nd. Uh, level three is the 50th to 78th. These are all, you know, guidelines. And, you know, within Department of Labor, there's... Uh, Part of the agency is uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So if you can imagine, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics collects quite a bit of uh, data, right? And, and part of that data 
would encompass what are the wages that are paid for some position. There's thousands of SOC codes, right? There's a lot of different uses that um, the government has to, to categorize, you know, employment, jobs, what it is, how much that person would earn. And then they also incorporate, uh, you know, where you live. So the cost of living is a factor that's involved with that. Uh, the, uh, tons of data points. And then that, that's how we get to that. So uh, basically what they're saying is when everything was traditionally set and done correctly, those, those percentile points are pretty much a pretty good standard as far as like uh, wage level one usually is typically entry level into a, a profession. So let's say, for example, you're a computer programmer and you use 151132. Uh, that means that typical entry level for that position is bachelor's degree. If you, uh, with probably one to two years of experience, if you add more experience, that can increase the wage level. So it's not about you personally, as far as what your credentials are, it's what the position is. So if you require, uh, let's say I have a uh, tech company and I wanna hire you to work for me as a software developer, and I use the SOC code 151132, but my minimum requirement for the position is a master's degree, okay, then that's automatically gonna to go to wage level two. Right. And then if I say a master's degree plus three or four years of experience, that's going to do to that. That's going to go up another notch. If you supervise other people, if the position supervises other people, that also increases the wage level. So that's how we determine wage levels. Uh, and, it, you know, it's, there's, it's a lot of information. It gets pretty boring pretty quick. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, I understand. But um, the recent changes is a is a is a too high the percentage compared to the percentage percentile. So that's why I, I want to bring this up. I want to discuss very deep how the US, uh, USCS or Department of Labor, how does it work on to get the percentile increase in, in, year on year? So, so the, the process is, is, is something we that falls under what we call the uh, Administrative Procedures Act, or the APA. Uh, and what that means is Congress has the authority that they'll issue a, a statute or a law, okay? And once the law is codified and signed you know, by the president, uh, you know, it might be a paragraph or a few sentences, but those few sentences could be, can mean a lot in, in regards to application. So, it's just like for adjustment of status under um, the, the section would be 245A. Uh, it allows people to adjust their status in the United States. It, you know, it has certain clauses and subclauses within that. But all these other rules and applications, um, you know, we have uh, a certain process that Congress cannot write a law to cover everything. So there has to be certain... Auto uh, autonomy within the, the agency itself where they can come up with their own processes and procedures and regulations and rules to uh, administer what, you know, the law, the statute authorizes. And um, part of that process is we hear about this rulemaking and posting and comment period and things like this. And these are all terms used uh, for that process. So whenever there's a new rule, uh, that the agency needs to implement, what they'll do is they have to publish uh, what the proposed rule is. There has to be a notice and comment period. So everyone in the public can, you know, review, see, make questions, you know, uh, maybe bring up points that weren't thought that could help, uh, you know, with, with the future uh, processing of certain things, right? So all these are considered and then, you know, the rule would then be published or, or whatnot. Um, and what hap has happened with these new rules is there's been no notice or comment period. Um, there's a few exceptions for emergencies that, you know, the government or the agency can go ahead and post the new rules without all these extra requirements. But, you know, we, you know, the, this administration has pretty much circumvented any, any real requirement, much like, um, you know, he's using COVID to halt all the 
visas. So he, he, it appears whenever he signs an executive order, I'm suspending all H-1B visas and J visas and whatever else. What he's, he's really doing is using the um, emergency uh, powers of, that he has to stop, you know, visa appointments and things like that. But, you know, it, he's trying to, you know, rebrand that to help, you know, political uh, purposes for himself. Okay, so as we, uh, Lucas, as we, as you said, actually, IT Alliance and some other autonomy groups are already filed against the new wages hike. Hey, Amen. ISA is a topmost uh, university is also filed against the new wages. Let's say the code uh, maybe might be injection on the new wages. What happened? So still, the the we can apply the new LCA based on the previous wages or L Department of Labor will re uh, release the new wages of how how does it work if in these scenarios? Well, usually when an injunction is signed, either if it's something like the issuance or use of new forms, I mean, it's very easy for the judge to say, you know, it needs to be removed from the website. You can't use this. You know, there's other forms already currently in use. Uh, you know, that that's easy. Uh, when something like this changes, um, I would imagine the, the the court would have to allow maybe 24 hours, 48 hours for, for everything to be reset. I think um, it took, so within the flag system where we file the LCAs and the, the prevailing wages for perms, uh, it, the LCAs were, you know, ready to go on, on that Thursday. Uh, and then I want to say it took two other extra days for it to, the system to be updated. So, I mean, if the judge comes in tomorrow and says, you know, yes, here's an injunction, you have to go back to the way it was. Um, I might, I don't know. I might tech savvy enough to know how fast it is to, to move the switch to go back to the old system or if, if it even takes any time at all, but that's the consideration a court would use. They would, you know, you have to have a certain practical time, uh, because it is an order of the court. You have to comply with it. Uh, but, you know, it would be unfair to have it immediately take effect if it's going to take you two or three days to, you know, go back. So all that will be discussed in whichever court is going to issue the injunction. And, uh, you know, it's just some of the details that go into the order. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hopefully, maybe sooner we get the injection so that everyone, whoever are in an extension period, maybe they can use the... I think they are eagerly waiting for the um, the good news from the agencies or maybe court so that they can apply based on the previous wages. Or... Correct. So, Lucas, yeah, hopefully it will uh, get the good news. We hopefully. So, so Lucas, we can go for the next uh, the the work location, right? This is a it means a. Um, the small topic, but very important to while up, apply the LCA. So let's say in pandemic situation, most of every, every all employees are working from home. Let's say if employee in the within the MSA region, if uh, MSA region, so I think USCS is not uh, asking to amendment or uh, uh, take a new LCA, right? So even USCS give the some liberty to um not apply maybe not take the new lca within the msa region maybe whoever outside of the msa region they they should take the lca and uh, notify to the uscs so in other some 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 other ways uh one of the h1 holder is applied for extension with his uh, work location home address is same mm -hmm. so after a couple of months uh, i think uh, he he tried to move to the another uh, change it means how he, ch he want to change the house maybe apartment or house so in this scenario do we need to apply the new lca or do we need to apply the amendment how does how how does it work in these scenarios so that's a good question and um you're correct so you file lca and you file your extension. Now, from 
you are permitted, even with, let's say there's no COVID right now, you are permitted to have temporary, uh, uh, you know, address changes uh, as long as it's not a permanent move. It's like, let's say you work somewhere else for a few weeks or something like that. That's permitted without filing anything. Um, as the pandemic has started and continued to move, as best practice, I've been listing uh, both home and uh, work location on LCAs. So you can list up to three locations. Um, and, and then that way, you know, we can support that, that, you know, hopefully touch wood, everything goes away and goes back to normal in a few months. You can then go back to your project without having to refile and go through the headache of all of that again for your H1. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, second thing, let's say like what you're saying, I'm working for remotely. Um, and then I also, you know, I'm in the same area, but then I'm going to move apartments or move house and I have a new address, but it's the same MSA, which means the same metropolitan statistical area, which would be, you know, like here in Dallas would be Dallas, Fort Worth, a lot of some, you know, surrounding suburbs. Um, in that situation, the best practice would be to file a new LCA but you don't have to file an amendment. Now you do have to file an amendment if you change MSAs or if there's a substantial change in your employment, um, much like a, a different SOC code or a job title or maybe a, a pay raise or something like this. Uh, and there's a lot of you know, other factors involved, but the most uh, you commonly used factor uh, whenever you decide to file an amendment it's based upon if you're moving outside of that area, okay? Uh, and there was a case that, you know, was, uh, that handled this and USCIS adopted and it's called Matter of Simio Solutions. And, uh, you know, they had quite a people that they were pushing the, the temporary work relocation back in uh, 2014 and 15. And because of that, uh, you know, stepping over the line, uh, USCIS basically came out with this rule uh, or adopted this decision from a, uh, an AAO uh, case, and that's that's kind of where we're at now. So uh, to go back to your question, like I said, I think best practice, if you're in the same MSA, just file a new LCA. Uh, and if you're outside of that area, then obviously you have to file the LCA in an amendment with uh, USCIS. Okay. So, is there any chance to get sometimes after he moved to the uh, home, or let's say he moved, he planned to the move next uh, November second. So, when he want to apply after move the home, or maybe before the before move the home, when he want to apply LCA or well, amendment. So, so it's very important. Um, when you're filing an amendment with USCIS, like if you're changing projects or whatever it might be, whatever is required for that amendment, you have to file with USCIS prior to the start date. Okay, so you can't, uh, and I know a lot of people do this because they're uncertain whether or not, you know, project's going to last or, you know, what's going to happen. But uh, you're technically, you're supposed to file prior to, you, to joining the project or moving. Um, as far as like, if you're within the same MSA, uh, you know, if you know that you're moving on November 2nd, um, you can file the LCA in advance and then have it, the requested start date is November 2nd. So that would be, you know, fine with that. Okay. So Lucas, I think, um, the USA has increased the premium process. Is one hundred and forty four hundred and one one thousand four hundred forty two two thousand five hundred, right? It already started from October nineteen, right? So, it is only the this changes only the H one I seven nine seven or all segments? Maybe uh, I one forty. It's going to impact all segments, uh, but different visa categories within I one twenty nine would be. Uh, different, so there's a, a different fee. I think it's now fourteen fifty for uh, our visa H two B. I don't have the list in front of me, but I think it's those two. Uh, but pr primarily H one Bs goes up to twenty five hundred. 
Uh, and a lot of people have asked also, well, we just discussed probably in too much detail uh, the rulemaking process and everything else with uh, USCIS uh, with the new wage levels and things like this. And, and the question is, well, wouldn't this also apply to, to the new fee increase? And the answer to that would be no, because um, Congress authorized USCIS to increase the fees if necessary up to $2,500. And that was part of a CARES Act package or some, you know, to keep the government open and stimulus money and things like that. And uh, so Congress, obviously, there's no rulemaking or anything else required because Congress is the ones who, you know, we authorize to make our rules all the time for statutes and laws. Uh, and they were the ones who included that uh, within one of these uh, funding bills uh, and um, you know the, when the president signed into law it, it did increase and they rightfully so it has they have the authorization to increase the fee and again like we said before in speculating about an election I mean you know in the future the uh, future administration could also decrease the fees go back to 14 there's no there's not no requirement that they have to stay at 2500 the the what the was signed was that USCIS has the option as necessary uh, to to increase the fees uh, if required. So most people don't realize this, but um, like uh, we have certain departments in our government that are uh, funded by um, our tax dollars. Well, USCIS is not funded by our tax dollars. It's funded by filing fees and everything else. And, and we were speaking also earlier this year that we, uh, USCIS was going to furlough, you know, all the, you know, probably two thirds of the workforce because they were going to run out of money. Well, in reality, and that's where this fee increase came from, was to help alleviate any kind of shortfalls in the future. But, um, you know, really, they, they, they come to find out they weren't really running uh, low on money. It's just, uh, again, you know, uh, the administration trying to cause issues within our immigration system so i don't want to go too much deeper into that but you know just as this was increased to 2500 the end of the day you know maybe in the future someone might analyze this and see is the fee really appropriate is it because it, it's here to benefit uh the beneficiary or the whoever it might or the petitioner whatever it might be and uh if it's you know uscis uh they charge high enough fees already uh, you know, a government agency is not supposed to be a for you know, may try to make profit. So hopefully a future administration or future director will analyze it and, and adjust the cost accordingly. Okay. So I think recently USCIS allowed to for apply the premium process for H, uh, H4 EAD and uh, J2 EAD. Is USCIS allowing to process in premium process? They they have to publish that. Now, I've been busy with adjustments and things like this here recently. I haven't read anything for that started yet. Uh, but okay. that was also part of the authorization where they, they could. But again, it's much like what we discussed uh, previously. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we have the visa bulletin. And uh, those are the dates published. And USCIS uh, has to adopt the date you know, for the filing dates uh, based upon their ability to complete the work or take the filings. It's the same thing uh, for the other. So once they implement this, then, you know, it would be available. But as far as I know right now, it's not implemented. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, as we're discussing you know, applying the 485 October visa bulletin process, the most of the uh, H1 holders are EB2 holders are waiting for the November visa bulletin. So mm -hmm. when we are expecting visa bulletin, October 24 by this Friday, can we expect a visa bulletin? Probably not. I would imagine they're going to wait uh, closer, maybe two or three, four days before the end of the month. So is that what? What is Friday? The 25th. Is it 20, 20, 23rd? Probably by this time next week, okay. maybe by next Monday or Tuesday. And the reason being, uh, no one knows what the new 
visa bulletin dates are going to be because no one knows how many cases are filed. No one knows how many, you know, there's a lot of people right now that are stuck back home because they can't get the fresh stamp. So they've been there for you know months because of okay. the pandemic. Uh, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, that, that is uh, my question. It means uh, already October visa bulletin are in process to applying the 485. I'm not sure all are applied till date or something. So I think USCS or uh, Department of State do not have the pro exact statistics of how many members is applying. So that is a one thing. And uh, the EB2 categories are waiting uh, 2011 and 2012 between. So if if EB2 is moving towards maybe a couple of months or six months or seven months, maybe they are expecting to apply. They are expecting to apply the right. 485 in the uh, without downgrade EB2 to EB3, the so, I-140 process. Here's a, uh, I understand what you're saying, and here's what I'm going to mention, because I spoke to many people about this uh, privately. Um, don't wait to the last minute, number one, because you might not have any uh, attorney that can take the case. I know a lot of attorneys have already stopped taking cases. Um, that's number one. Number two, uh, even if, let's say, it, it, and at most EB2, my prediction, at most, it's only going to move two months for the filing date. Uh, so, you know, it's not going to move six months in one month. It's, that's not going to happen. That's number one. Number two, USCIS, like I just mentioned, has the ability to accept the filing date or the final action date. Now, let's say 20,000 people right now this month have mailed in adjustment ap applications. OK, if, if it's if they're overwhelmed, which I'm pretty sure USCIS will be, they're going to re revert to the final action date for the next two or three months, possibly, while they're processing and handling this intake. OK, so just because Visa Bulletin might say uh, something for November does not mean USCIS will honor the filing date for November. OK, so right now is October. Uh, in October, if you have an opportunity, then you should file in October because um, if you it, you might miss out completely if you don't. That, that's my yeah. advice. Yeah, even um, the next uh, visa bulletin, November visa bulletin, the USCS and moved in um, uh, 2013, maybe but December 2012 and filing date, it's not necessarily to take on the uh, files on um, the filing date. Maybe they can take on the final action date. The final action date always in uh, back in 2010. So even the filing date is moved forward, it's not necessary to take the files, right, Lucas? 100% correct. You are correct. And then also, you know, I, I would predict also EB3 going backwards quite a bit as, as the months move on because of so many people downgrading. Um, and, you know, like I said, we don't know, you know, people who are worried about this and, you know, they want to hold on to the EB-2. Even, let's say you have uh, October 2011 EB-2, okay? And maybe I've, I can file in a couple months. Well, maybe you can. Uh, or maybe it doesn't matter because you're still two or three years away, you know, for the final action date. So as of right now, to get the application filed, it, sh it doesn't matter. It's basically getting your foot in the door. That's the strategy you should have. Um, number two... Like I said before, if something were to happen and the agent, the president and Congress say, hey, we got to get rid of this backlog. There's all these people waiting in, in the current wait time. I, you know, someone right now uh, might be waiting 60 plus years or 90 years, whatever the estimate might be. Uh, let's clear the backlog and we're going to issue one million visas or whatever it is to clear the backlog. Well, it does at that point, it doesn't even matter if you're EB2 or EB3. OK. Um, and and that, that's why I'm saying you, you should take, keep in mind the big picture and not get so focused on these micro strategies. And that's what it is. It's just these small ideas of maybe I can hold out and file here to benefit this. And if this happens and this happens, you know, you, you shouldn't think that way. The way you should think is today, here's my opportunity. It's a yes or no question and answer. Do I want to file for adjustment of status? If yes, I'm, I know what I'm expecting. If no, then if the dates aren't there next month, I've already made the decision. I, I'm not ready to file. 
So that's the way you should approach it. And you should not be focused on if this event occurs, then this happens or this and that. Because we, we, I mean, no one knows what the, the future will hold. Yeah, that is a, a wonderful information, Lucas. So hopefully, yeah, everyone will utilize this opportunity and apply the 485 so that everyone can get benefited or who fall into this, the green card uh, members. So yeah, I think in conference call, I think uh, we have a couple of members. So if you have any questions, maybe you can raise a, raise a question. Lucas will give the, the more information. If not, we can uh, go ahead. Uh, last four is it uh, six five three nine? Do you have any question? Yeah, uh, am am I audible? Yes, go ahead. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi, both of you. Thanks a lot uh, for taking the call. Uh, this is Raj, and I just have a question. Uh, I applied my four eighty five uh, last week. I didn't get the receipt number yet. Um, but the thing is, if I want to switch job right now using my H1, now that I have filed my 485, um, do you see any challenge there uh, switching jobs right now to a different company? So that's a good question. Uh, I'm going to answer it in two parts because there's a, important information I want everyone to know. Uh, we touched on this, I think, last week. Uh, don't expect receipts to come as fast as H1 receipts, okay? It, there, there's a process of a lockbox process where the forms are all scanned, everything's checked to, for completion, that checks are uh, included with this, that you know everything's there, proper documents are all part of the application, and then it's forwarded to a uh, adjudication, okay? So it's, it, it could take probably four to six weeks to really realistically get the receipts, uh, number one. Number two, your question about changing from current employer to another employer with a pending adjustment, and that, that's perfectly fine. Uh, you don't even, you're not even required to technically work for the uh, employer uh, until, you know, you have GC. And even at that point, you're not required to actually work for them. Um, <clears throat> so if you're changing now, that's not a problem. And uh, let's say like what we just discussed, you know, six months from now, or seven months from now, there's uh, the backlogs address and everyone's processing, you know, the final action date, everything's moving, moving, moving. Well, at that point, you could just have a new employer sign a supplement J uh, as, as your visa becomes available. And then that, that's the only time you would have to worry about that. Uh, and you would have to have your adjustment pending for six months to be able to do that. Okay. I think yeah, that, but, uh, Ross. I'm not Let's say I'm not planning to let, let's say I'm not planning to use my 485 EAD. Uh, uh -huh. If I still continue with my H1, then would that be a problem? I mean, like, I, let's say I'm not going to use it at all. I'm still going to continue for next two years using my H1. Um, in that case, I don't have to submit a 485J right away, right? I mean, once I start using, that's when I would have to submit it, right? No, no, no. So the 485J uh, is, is basically to be adjudicated with your 485 uh, and if your I-140 has been filed for more than six months, then you have to have that, okay? So um, you, you might change, if, if it's three or four years before you get GC in hand, maybe you change jobs twice. Uh, but it's only whenever your final action date becomes current and USCIS starts working on your case again. Uh, typically, when, when the interview is assigned, um, you would just bring that with you to the interview and hopefully within the next two weeks after that you would have gc in hand from them in, in the mail um so you know you don't it, this isn't a document that you have to get every time you change employers or anything like that and uh Raj, it's it is very smart like what you're saying to keep maintain your h1 status while this is pending um and, and that's you know really the right process the right procedure to to go through to make sure um you know you have insurance everything's your, your case is safe okay Okay, one, one last thing. Um, let's say um, now I switch jobs for extending um, my EAD and parole. Do I need anything from my ex-employer after I switch the job? 
No, all you need is your receipts uh, of your pending I-45. And, uh, you, you know, just remember, whenever you submit your I-45, that's your application. It's independent of anything to do with your employer. Uh, same with EAD, same with advanced parole. It's private. It's your, it's your case. Uh, when you file I-140, and this is, I also want to bring this up since, you know, you mentioned it like this. Um, it, I always want to tell people, um, whenever you file I-140, you actually uh, have two people who quote unquote own the case. That's the petitioner, your employer, and then also the beneficiary, which would be you. Uh, a lot of employers I know don't share I-140s, um, and that's why some people can request that they go and request a FOIA request and get a copy of it, Well, in part because it's also their case. Now, any attorney who filed your I-140 is required to give, give you a copy of the file and all these documents if you request them. Uh, so just as you can do that for I-140, your employer can't go and request these same documents um, from USAS or make you provide them or anything like that. It's private. Did that answer Thank your you. question? Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for calling, Raj. Yeah, thanks, Raj. Uh, being with the Radio. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if anyone have any questions, maybe you can post or you can um, you know you can ask ask the questions, or else uh, we are already ending the show. The next two minutes is left, and if you don't have any questions, we can we can close the today's session. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Raj. I think uh, Lucas, uh, we don't have any questions today from the so you you can share if you have any additional additional um, information or maybe in process or if you want to share any uh, anything about the process Lucas? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were waiting on someone. Uh, no, uh, so, no. You know, like like what we said before, we want to make sure uh, patience is key on this. And uh, I know a lot of people will reopen this, the show saying we only have X amount of days left and we want to send. But, you know, all this work is for nothing if it's incorrect or missing something. So be patient. Uh, let's make sure if you're working with attorney, make sure that you provide information that's needed, uh, have patience with it. Remember that, you know, once the case is submitted, it's going to be uh, four to six weeks probably before you get a receipt in the mail. Now, receipt will come to your address and also to the attorney. Um, and then moving forward, just like what Raj brought up, in the future, when you need to renew your EAD and advanced parole, all you need is a copy of the receipt of the 485 receipt to deal with that. So, um, you know, hope everyone has a great week this week. Uh, again, you know, we always like to close. Uh, like and follow us on our Facebook page for Telugu NRA Radio and also for Burgos and Garrettson Law. Uh, if you have any specific questions or you want to talk offline, uh, we can go ahead. We're, we're able to go ahead and help it address uh, those calls at the, you know, appropriately offline. Um, and uh, hopefully we have good news next week going back to the wage level increases to where they're back to the uh, previous levels. So, again, thank, thanks everyone for participating and calling in, and uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you first, you, it means you, you've given the one or time. I know this is a very precious time to you. Thanks for your time. Yeah, definitely. If if anyone have any questions on immigrations, you can uh, post or you can send an email to info at the rate 